Hello and welcome to VOS Red Carpet. My name is Jackson Vungani. Thank you so much for joining us today. On this episode of Red Carpet, we have an international collective promoting the diversity of Africa's dancers. Inmates in a Colorado prison find inspiration in radio broadcasts, and a Sudanese woman hopes to be her country's first wrestler to make it to the Olympics. Let's get on with the show. And let's start off the show with some latest entertainment news from around the world. And let's head over to Brooklyn, New York, where R&B singer R. Kelly was sentenced to 30 years in prison for sexual abuse, marking the end of a sordid, stunning fall for the multi-platinum artist who, at 55, could spend the rest of his life behind bars. The sentence was imposed nine months after Kelly was convicted of racketeering and sex crimes, which included luring women, underage girls, into his orbit for sex. But the singer has sued the Brooklyn jail that has housed him since his racketeering and sex crime conviction, saying that officials at the Metropolitan Detention Center ordered the watch after his sentencing solely for punitive purposes and because he was a high-profile inmate. And in more music news, superstar Drake joined boy band The Backstreet Boys on stage at their show in Toronto, Canada at the weekend. The boy band posted a video on their social media of Drake dancing and singing along to their performance of I Want It That Way, much to the delight of their enthusiastic fans. In the French southern port city of Marseille, a collective of dancers from all over the world, critics of the Afro dance concept, explores the most traditional and current African dances that are represented on its own online platform, Afropolis, much smaller and better controlled than the big social media networks. Let's check it out. For me, there is nothing like African dance. There is only dance in Africa. So now, if we look at it from that point of view, then we can see that between Abidjan and Accra and Lagos and Johannesburg and Luanda and Maputo and Maroc <laughs> and, and Cairo, different. So there is no way we can uniform all of that. And that for me is what I've tried as much as possible to do, to bring people from those different sensibilities and different ways of moving, to come and create a kind of a, a shock of encounter between all of them together. We had just finished a session that I call Idon. Idon in my language in Nigeria means performative, performance and magic. So we just created magic here through um, using the dance styles from Lagos, that's the street dance styles from Lagos, and uh, an element and infusion of Afro House from Angola and, and South Africa. Maybe we need communities more than globalization. Maybe we need uh, uh, intercommunal exchange, you know, the community of dancers in London come together with the community of dancers in Paris and they form another kind of community. So for me, that is the reason why we are creating this platform, so that we can do something smaller and much more controlled. About 5 million Ukrainian refugees have fled to other parts of Europe since Russia's assault on their homeland began. Among them, nearly three dozen dancers from the Kyiv City Ballet. They have found refuge in Paris and continue to perform and plan foreign tours. But the conflict is never far away. For BOA, Lisa Bryant has more from Paris. For these Ukrainian dancers, an artistic tour around France has turned into an indefinite stay. As they performed in Paris late February, Russia was invading their homeland. The day it happened, uh, everybody were on the phone, uh, everybody allowed to bring their phones on the stage so they could stay with their families. Everybody was shocked, everybody didn't know what to do. Paris City Hall has granted Ivan Kozlov's company artistic residency. This theater and others are putting them up at a suburban hotel. We met with Madame La Mer, uh, Anne Hidalgo, and uh, we spoke on, st on the stage, and she said that uh, now Théâtre du Châtelet is our base. We can work here, we can perform here. 
Other key dancers have since joined the troupe here in Paris. After the war started, I understood that I can't literally live without things I usually do, without belly. Yes, and um, I understood that this is exactly the thing which can save me. When we came here, um, practically no one knew each other, but uh, right now we are really a very friendly. Everyone here has family and friends back home, caught up in some way by the fighting. The troop is raising money for their homeland. At first I wanted to return to my family, but my parents said it wasn't necessary. They wanted me to stay here and be safe. Like a good fairy tale, Kuzma believes Ukraine will win the war. Lisa Bryant for VOA News, Paris. Now, many people consider prisons to be places to lock criminals away until their time is up. But a growing understanding about the healing and the skills needed for people to successfully rejoin their communities has led one state to provide a novel option for inmates. It's a radio station. From Denver, Colorado, Shelley Schlender reports. Barbed wire surrounds this Colorado women's prison. Inside, it's more friendly. Down this hallway is even a radio station. Welcome to Hotlines on Inside Wire. I'm Cynthia Gonzalez. I'm Amber Pierce. And I'm Sarah Berry. At Denver Women's Correctional Facility. Inside Wire, Colorado Prison Radio, is the first statewide prison radio station in the United States. Inmates can listen in their cells. People outside of prison can tune in through a smartphone app. Cynthia Gonzalez works on shows 50 hours a week. Like, oh, I can't wait to go to sleep at night so I can wake up in the morning and go to work. The team produces news and music. They also interview other people in the prison for a daily program called Behind the Mic. Behind the Mic on Inside Wire. On this show, Cynthia Gonzalez is talking with a mother whose addictions have landed her back in prison away from her kids. What do you think you want them to know about you most and forgive you for the most? That I chose my addiction over my kids. That's hard to say, but it's the truth. I chose drugs over my kids. And um, it cost them, and I pray that they can forgive me. Gonzalez says that being honest about regrets is often healing for the speaker and for listeners who had their own regrets, including Gonzalez. I had a victim, you know, and I, had, I left behind a victim's family. Her colleague Sarah Berry says crimes often happen when people are feeling broken. So she says she's working on healing from her past, mentoring other inmates and reaching out through radio. We're trying to create a space that actually gives like a, a positive way to actually become a part of your community. Helping the radio host is University of Denver creative media consultant Ryan Canero. Mm, there's just a one edit at four minutes, nine seconds to check. Canero views radio as part of rebuilding connections for inmates inside prison and out. You know, over 90% of um, Colorado uh, residents and facilities who are incarcerated will return to their community. And so what are we doing in the system to make that a successful experience? That's a personal question for producer Amber Pierce. After over a decade in prison, her release date is just two years away. What is it going to be like for me out there? Pierce says she's gaining confidence about her future by helping other inmates share what went wrong for them, what's going right, and how they are striving. Shelley Schlender for VOA News, Denver. And now to some sports news. Patricia Severin al Alhaj is hoping to be Sudan's first wrestler to make it to the Olympics. That's despite some suggesting that it's a sport only for men. Here is more. Patricia Saifedean Al Hajj grew up watching her grandfather wrestle in Sudan's Nuba Mountains. 
years later and she's got a shot at becoming the country's first wrestler at an Olympic Games. Having won a bronze medal in an African championship earlier this year, she's now training ahead of Paris 2024. Some people tell me that wrestling is difficult. And why did you choose this field? It entails violence. I tell them wrestling is not difficult. You may see it as difficult, but it's not beating each other. It has rules and practices. Even my friends ask me why I chose wrestling. I tell them because I inherited the practice from my grandfather. They tell me it's difficult. But I say it's not difficult at all, it's easy. Wrestling is an important element of cultural identity for communities in the Nuba Mountains, where young people show off their strength during the harvest season. It's been woven into the fabric of society for centuries. But today Sudan is grappling with a political deadlock and an economic crisis, as a result of a military coup last year. Al Hajj's coach Mustafa Hamad Ali says ambitious athletes like her are offered little support. He added that many say wrestling is just for men, but that it is an Olympic sport for everyone. The president of the Sudanese Wrestling Federation, Ala Gabu Suleiman Kabo, said Al Hajj had been given a grant from the Global Development Initiative Olympic Solidarity. That would facilitate, he said, two years of training in Nigeria with champion wrestlers. <laughs> Al Hajj encourages all Sudanese women to take up wrestling because, she says, at the moment, she's on her own. And we'll close the show with some more sports news. The National Football League, NFL, the top league in American style football, has hosted its first African developmental camp in Ghana's capital, Accra. The week-long program was aimed at finding fresh talent and building the sport's popularity across Africa. Sinanu Toad reports from Accra, Ghana. It was all fun and euphoria at the Kempinski Hotel in Accra, where fans of the National Football League, the NFL, assembled to meet with football athletes, stars and legends of the game. This is the first time the NFL is holding an event in Africa as part of its goal to grow the sport outside of the United States. According to NFL International's Chief Operating Officer, the league hopes to increase the number of players from Africa and also build its foreign fan base. The UN projects in the next 30 years, half the world's population growth is going to come from Africa. So more and more young people in the continent, um, rapid urbanization, more and more people moving into cities, becoming consumers of sports and entertainment. And as that gr grows and develops, we want the NFL to be in a position to grow and develop with it. According to the Ghana American Football Federation, this partnership with the NFL gives Ghanaian players an easy route to playing professional football. Another part of the project is to give children the opportunity to learn flag football. In a two-day event, the NFL team trains sports teachers and students from 10 schools in Accra about the less violent version of the sport. The program encourages Ghanaian kids to play the sport both locally and abroad. From here, those schools are going to go away and deliver flag um, and build towards a tournament in November. So we'll hold our first ever Accra flag football championships and within that, that we're Within that, a team from those schools will be selected to represent Ghana at the Pro Bowl in the International Division in 2023. Ghana's Vice President, Dr. Mohamed Dubaumia, lauded this initiative and pledged the government's support to help grow the NFL in Ghana. And that's it for this episode of VOS Red Carpet. My name is Jackson Fungani. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. For more of your entertainment news, check us out at voaafrica.com. We are also on all social media platforms, on Facebook, Instagram. We are also on YouTube where you can watch our videos. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye everyone.